Chapter Ten, Part One of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself, by Frederick Douglass. Chapter Ten. I left Master Thomas's house and went to live with Mister Covey on the first of January, eighteen thirty-three. I was now, for the first time in my life, a field hand. In my new employment, I found myself even more awkward than a country boy appeared to be in a large city. I had been at my new home but one week before Mr. Covey gave me a very severe whipping, cutting my back, causing the blood to run, and raising ridges on my flesh as large as my little finger. The details of this affair are as follows. Mr. Covey sent me, very early in the morning of one of our coldest days in the month of January, to the woods, to get a load of wood. He gave me a team of unbroken oxen. He told me which was the in-hand ox, and which the off-hand one. He then tied the end of a large rope around the horns of the in-hand ox, and gave me the other end of it, and told me, if the oxen started to run, that I must hold on upon the rope. I had never driven oxen before, and of course I was very awkward. I, however, succeeded in getting to the edge of the woods with little difficulty, but I had got a very few rods into the woods when the oxen took fright and started full tilt, carrying the cart against trees and over stumps in the most frightful manner. I expected every moment that my brains would be dashed out against the trees. After running thus for a considerable distance, they finally upset the cart, dashing it with great force against a tree, and threw themselves into a dense thicket. How I escaped death, I do not know. There I was, entirely alone, in a thick wood, in a place new to me. My cart was upset and shattered, my oxen were entangled among the young trees, and there was none to help me. After a long spell of effort I succeeded in getting my cart righted, my oxen disentangled, and again yoked to the cart. I now proceeded with my team to the place where I had the day before been chopping wood, and loaded my cart pretty heavily, thinking in this way to tame my oxen. I then proceeded on my way home. I had now consumed one half of the day. I got out of the woods safely, and now felt out of danger. I stopped my oxen to open the woods gate, and just as I did so, before I could get hold of my ox rope, the oxen again started, rushed through the gate, catching it between the wheel and the body of the cart, tearing it to pieces, and coming within a few inches of crushing me against the gate-post. Thus twice, in one short day, I escaped death by the merest chance. On my return I told Mr. Covey what had happened, and how it happened. He ordered me to return to the woods again immediately. I did so, and he followed on after me. Just as I got into the woods, he came up and told me to stop my cart, and that he would teach me how to trifle away my time and break gates. He then went to a large gum tree, and with his axe cut three large switches, and, after trimming them up neatly with his pocket knife, he ordered me to take off my clothes. I made him no answer, but stood with my clothes on. He repeated his order. I still made him no answer, nor did I move to strip myself. Upon this he rushed at me with the fierceness of a tiger, tore off my clothes, and lashed me till he had worn out his switches, cutting me so savagely as to leave the marks visible for a long time after. This whipping was the first of a number just like it, and for similar offences. I lived with Mr. Covey one year. During the first six months of that year, scarce a week passed without his whipping me. I was seldom free from a sore back. My awkwardness was almost always his excuse for whipping me. We were worked fully up to the point of endurance. Long before day we were up, our horses fed, and by the first approach of day we were off to the field with our hoes and ploughing teams. Mr. Covey gave us enough to eat, but scarce time to eat it. We were often less than five minutes taking our meals. We were often in the field from the first approach of day till its last lingering ray had left us, and at saving fodder time, midnight often caught us in the field, binding blades. Covey would be out with us. The way he used to stand it was this. He would spend the most of his afternoons in bed. He would then come out fresh in the evening, ready to urge us on with his words, example, and frequently with the whip. Mr. Covey was one of the few slaveholders who could and did work with his hands. He was a hard-working man. 
He knew by himself just what a man or a boy could do. There was no deceiving him. His work went on in his absence almost as well as in his presence, and he had the faculty of making us feel that he was ever present with us. This he did by surprising us. He seldom approached the spot where we were at work openly, if he could do it secretly. He always aimed at taking us by surprise. Such was his cunning that we used to call him, among ourselves, the snake. When we were at work in the cornfield, he would sometimes crawl on his hands and knees to avoid detection, and all at once he would rise nearly in our midst and scream out, Ha ha! Come, come! Dash on! Dash on! This being his mode of attack, it was never safe to stop a single minute. His comings were like a thief in the night. He appeared to us as being ever at hand. He was under every tree, behind every stump, in every bush, and at every window on the plantation. He would sometimes mount his horse as if bound to St. Michael's, a distance of seven miles, and in half an hour afterwards you would see him coiled up in the corner of the wood fence, watching every motion of the slaves. He would, for this purpose, leave his horse tied up in the woods. Again, he would sometimes walk up to us, and give us orders as though he was upon the point of starting on a long journey, turn his back upon us, and make as though he was going to the house to get ready, and, before he would get halfway thither, he would turn short and crawl into a fence corner, or behind some tree, and there watch us till the going down of the sun. Mr. Covey's forte consisted in his power to deceive. His life was devoted to planning and perpetrating the grossest deceptions. Everything he possessed in the shape of learning or religion he made conform to his disposition to deceive. He seemed to think himself equal to deceiving the Almighty. He would make a short prayer in the morning and a long prayer at night, and, strange as it may seem, few men would at times appear more devotional than he. The exercises of his family devotions were always commenced with singing, and as he was a very poor singer himself, the duty of raising the hymn generally came upon me. He would read his hymn, and nod at me to commence. I would at times do so, at others I would not. My non-compliance would almost always produce much confusion. To show himself independent of me, he would start and stagger through his hymn in the most discordant manner. In this state of mind he prayed with more than ordinary spirit. Poor man, such was his disposition and success at deceiving, I do verily believe that he sometimes deceived himself into the solemn belief that he was a sincere worshipper of the Most High God, and this, too, at a time when he may be said to have been guilty of compelling his woman-slave to commit the sin of adultery. The facts in the case are these. Mr. Covey was a poor man. He was just commencing in life. He was only able to buy one slave, and, shocking as is the fact, he bought her, as he said, for a breeder. This woman was named Caroline. Mr. Covey bought her from Mr. Thomas Lowe, about six miles from St. Michael's. She was a large, able-bodied woman, about twenty years old. She had already given birth to one child, which proved her to be just what he wanted. After buying her, he hired a married man of Mr. Samuel Harrison to live with him one year, and him he used to fasten up with her every night. The result was that, at the end of the year, the miserable woman gave birth to twins. At this result Mr. Covey seemed to be highly pleased, both with the man and the wretched woman. Such was his joy and that of his wife, that nothing they could do for Caroline during her confinement was too good or too hard to be done. The children were regarded as being quite an addition to his wealth. If at any one time of my life more than another I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that time was during the first six months of my stay with Mr. Covey. We were worked in all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. The longest days were too short for him, and the shortest nights too long for him. I was somewhat unmanageable when I first went there, but a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed, my intellect languished, the disposition to read departed, the cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. 
the dark night of slavery closed in upon me and behold a man transformed into a brute sunday was my only leisure time i spent this in a sort of beast-like stupor between sleep and wake under some large tree at times i would rise up a flash of energetic freedom would dart through my soul accompanied with a faint beam of hope that flickered for a moment and then vanished i sank down again mourning over my wretched condition i was sometimes prompted to take my life and that of covey but was prevented by a combination of hope and fear my sufferings on this plantation seem now like a dream rather than a stern reality our house stood within a few rods of the chesapeake bay whose broad bosom was ever white with sails from every quarter of the habitable globe those beautiful vessels robed in purest white so delightful to the eye of freemen were to me so many shrouded ghosts to terrify and torment me with thoughts of my wretched condition i have often in the deep stillness of a summer's sabbath stood all alone upon the lofty banks of that noble bay and traced with saddened heart and tearful eye the countless number of sails moving off to the mighty ocean the sight of these always affected me powerfully my thoughts would compel utterance and there with no audience but the almighty i would pour out my soul's complaint in my rude way with an apostrophe to the moving multitude of ships you are loosed from your moorings and are free i am fast in my chains and am a slave you move merrily before the gentle gale and i sadly before the bloody whip you are freedom's swift-winged angels that fly round the world i am confined in bands of iron oh that i were free oh that i were on one of your gallant decks and under your protective wing alas betwixt me and you the turbid waters roll go on go on oh that i could also go could i but swim if i could fly oh why was i born a man of whom to make a brute the glad ship is gone she hides in the dim distance i am left in the hottest hell of unending slavery oh god save me god deliver me let me be free is there any god why am i a slave i will run away i will not stand it get caught or get clear i'll try it i had as well die with ague as the fever i have only one life to lose i had as well be killed running as die standing only think of it one hundred miles straight north and i am free try it yes god helping me i will it cannot be that i shall live and die a slave i will take to the water this very bay shall yet bear me into freedom the steamboat steered in a northeast course from north point i will do the same and when i get to the head of the bay i will turn my canoe adrift and walk straight through delaware into pennsylvania when i get there i shall not be required to have a pass i can travel without being disturbed let but the first opportunity offer and come what will i am off meanwhile i will try to bear up under the yoke i am not the only slave in the world why should i fret i can bear as much as any of them besides i am but a boy and all boys are bound to some one it may be that my misery in slavery will only increase my happiness when i get free there is a better day coming thus i used to think and thus i used to speak to myself goaded almost to madness at one moment and at the next reconciling myself to my wretched lot i have already intimated that my condition was much worse during the first six months of my stay at mr covey's than in the last six the circumstances leading to the change in mr covey's course toward me form an epoch in my humble history you have seen how a man was made a slave you shall see how a slave was made a man on one of the hottest days of the month of august eighteen thirty three bill smith william hughes a slave named eli and myself were engaged in fanning wheat hughes was clearing the fanned wheat from before the fan eli was turning smith was feeding and i was carrying wheat to the fan the work was simple requiring strength rather than intellect yet to one entirely unused to such work it came very hard about three o'clock of that day i broke down my strength failed me i was seized with a violent aching of the head attended with extreme dizziness i trembled in every limb 
Finding what was coming, I nerved myself up, feeling it would never do to stop work. I stood as long as I could stagger to the hopper with grain. When I could stand no longer, I fell, and felt as if held down by an immense weight. The fan, of course, stopped. Every one had his own work to do, and no one could do the work of the other and have his own go on at the same time. Mr. Covey was at the house about one hundred yards from the treading yard where we were fanning. On hearing the fan stop, he left immediately and came to the spot where we were. He hastily inquired what the matter was. Bill answered that I was sick and there was no one to bring wheat to the fan. I had by this time crawled away under the side of the post and rail fence by which the yard was enclosed, hoping to find relief by getting out of the sun. He then asked where I was. He was told by one of the hands. He came to the spot and, after looking at me a while, asked me what was the matter. I told him as well as I could, for I scarce had strength to speak. He then gave me a savage kick in the side and told me to get up. I tried to do so, but fell back in the attempt. He gave me another kick, and again told me to rise. I again tried, and succeeded in gaining my feet, but, stooping to get the tub with which I was feeding the fan, I again staggered and fell. While down in this situation, Mr. Covey took up the hickory slat with which Hughes had been striking off the half-bushel measure, and with it gave me a heavy blow upon the head, making a large wound, and the blood ran freely and with this again told me to get up. I made no effort to comply, having now made up my mind to let him do his worst. In a short time after receiving this blow, my head grew better. Mr. Covey had now left me to my fate. At this moment I resolved, for the first time, to go to my master, enter a complaint, and ask his protection. In order to do this I must that afternoon walk seven miles, and this, under the circumstances, was truly a severe undertaking. I was exceedingly feeble, made so as much by the kicks and blows which I received as by the severe fit of sickness to which I had been subjected. I, however, watched my chance while Covey was looking in an opposite direction and started for St. Michael's. I succeeded in getting a considerable distance on my way to the woods when Covey discovered me and called after me to come back threatening what he would do if I did not come. I disregarded both his calls and his threats, and made my way to the woods as fast as my feeble state would allow, and thinking I might be overhauled by him if I kept the road, I walked through the woods, keeping far enough from the road to avoid detection, and near enough to prevent losing my way. I had not gone far before my little strength again failed me. I could go no further." I fell down and lay for a considerable time. The blood was yet oozing from the wound on my head. For a time I thought I should bleed to death, and think now that I should have done so, but that the blood so matted my hair as to stop the wound. After lying there about three-quarters of an hour, I nerved myself up again, and started on my way, through bogs and briars, barefooted and bareheaded, tearing my feet sometimes at nearly every step, and after a journey of about seven miles, occupying some five hours to perform it, I arrived at Master's store. I then presented an appearance enough to affect any but a heart of iron. From the crown of my head to my feet I was covered with blood. My hair was all clotted with dust and blood. My shirt was stiff with blood. My legs and feet were torn in sundry places with briars and thorns, and were also covered with blood. I suppose I looked like a man who had escaped a den of wild beasts, and barely escaped them. In this state I appeared before my master, humbly entreating him to interpose his authority for my protection. I told him all the circumstances as well as I could, and it seemed, as I spoke, at times to affect him. He would then walk the floor and seek to justify Covey by saying he expected I deserved it. He asked me what I wanted. I told him to let me get a new home, that as sure as I lived with Mr. Covey again, I should live with but to die with him, that Covey would surely kill me. He was in a fair way for it. Master Thomas ridiculed the idea that there was any danger of Mr. Covey's killing me, and said that he knew Mr. Covey, that he was a good man, and that he could not think of taking me from him, that, should he do so, he would lose the whole year's wages. 
that i belonged to mr covey for one year and that i must go back to him come what might and that i must not trouble him with any more stories or that he would himself get hold of me after threatening me thus he gave me a very large dose of salts telling me that i might remain in st michael's that night it being quite late but that i must be off back to mr covey's early in the morning and that if i did not he would get hold of me which meant that he would whip me i remained all night and according to his orders i started off to covey's in the morning saturday morning wearied in body and broken in spirit i got no supper that night or breakfast that morning i reached covey's about nine o'clock and just as i was getting over the fence that divided mrs kemp's fields from ours out ran covey with his cowskin to give me another whipping before he could reach me i succeeded in getting to the cornfield and as the corn was very high it afforded me the means of hiding he seemed very angry and searched for me a long time my behavior was altogether unaccountable he finally gave up the chase thinking i suppose that i must come home for something to eat he would give himself no further trouble in looking for me i spent that day mostly in the woods having the alternative before me to go home and be whipped to death or stay in the woods and be starved to death that night i fell in with sandy jenkins a slave with whom i was somewhat acquainted sandy had a free wife who lived about four miles from mr covey's and it being saturday he was on his way to see her i told him my circumstances and he very kindly invited me to go home with him i went home with him and talked this whole matter over and got his advice as to what course it was best for me to pursue i found sandy an old adviser he told me with great solemnity i must go back to covey but that before i went i must go with him into another part of the woods where there was a certain route which if i would take some of it with me carrying it always on my right side would render it impossible for mr covey or any other white man to whip me he said he had carried it for years and since he had done so he had never received a blow and never expected to while he carried it i at first rejected the idea that the simple carrying of a root in my pocket would have any such effect as he had said and was not disposed to take it but sandy impressed the necessity with much earnestness telling me it could do no harm if it did no good to please him i at length took the root and according to his direction carried it upon my right side this was sunday morning i immediately started for home and upon entering the yard gate out came mr covey on his way to meeting he spoke to me very kindly bade me drive the pigs from a lot near by and passed on towards the church now this singular conduct of mr covey really made me begin to think that there was something in the route which sandy had given me and had it been on any other day than sunday i could have attributed the conduct to no other cause than the influence of that route and as it was i was half inclined to think the route to be something more than i at first had taken it to be all went well till monday morning on this morning the virtue of the route was fully tested long before daylight i was called to go and rub carry and feed the horses i obeyed and was glad to obey but whilst thus engaged whilst in the act of throwing down some blades from the loft mr covey entered the stable with a long rope and just as i was half out of the loft he caught hold of my legs and was about tying me as soon as i found what he was up to i gave a sudden spring and as i did so he holding to my legs i was brought sprawling on the stable floor mr covey seemed now to think he had me and could do what he pleased but at this moment from whence came the spirit i don't know i resolved to fight and suiting my action to the resolution i seized covey hard by the throat and as i did so i rose he held on to me and i to him my resistance was so entirely unexpected that covey seemed taken all aback he trembled like a leaf this gave me assurance and i held him uneasy causing the blood to run where i touched him with the ends of my fingers mr covey soon called out to hughes for help hughes came and while covey held me attempted to tie my right hand while he was in the act of doing so i watched my chance and gave him a heavy kick close under the ribs this kick fairly sickened hughes so that he left me in the hands of mr covey this kick had the effect of not only weakening hughes but covey also 
when he saw hughes bending over with pain his courage quailed he asked me if i meant to persist in my resistance i told him i did come what might that he had used me like a brute for six months and that i was determined to be used so no longer with that he strove to drag me to a stick that was lying just out of the stable door he meant to knock me down but just as he was leaning over to get the stick i seized him with both hands by his collar and brought him by a sudden snatch to the ground by this time bill came covey called upon him for assistance bill wanted to know what he could do covey said take hold of him take hold of him bill said his master hired him out to work and not to help to whip me so we left covey and myself to fight our own battle out we were at it for nearly two hours covey at length let me go puffing and blowing at a great rate saying that if i had not resisted he would not have whipped me half so much the truth was that he had not whipped me at all i considered him as getting entirely the worst end of the bargain for he had drawn no blood from me but i had from him the whole six months afterwards that i spent with mr covey he never laid the weight of his finger upon me in anger he would occasionally say he didn't want to get hold of me again no thought i you need not for you will come off worse than you did before this battle with mr covey was the turning point in my career as a slave it rekindled the few expiring embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood it recalled the departed self-confidence and inspired me again with a determination to be free the gratification afforded by the triumph was a full compensation for whatever else might follow even death itself he only can understand the deep satisfaction which i experienced who has himself repelled by force the bloody arm of slavery i felt as i never felt before it was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom my long crushed spirit rose cowardice departed bold defiance took its place and i now resolved that however long i might remain a slave in form the day had passed forever when i could be a slave in fact i did not hesitate to let it be known of me that the white man who expected to succeed in whipping must also succeed in killing me from this time i was never again what might be called fairly whipped though i remained a slave four years afterwards i had several fights but was never whipped it was for a long time a matter of surprise to me why mr covey did not immediately have me taken by the constable to the whipping post and there regularly whipped for the crime of raising my hand against a white man in defence of myself and the only explanation i can now think of does not entirely satisfy me but such as it is i will give it mr covey enjoyed the most unbounded reputation for being a first-rate overseer and negro breaker it was of considerable importance to him that reputation was at stake and had he sent me a boy about sixteen years old to the public whipping post his reputation would have been lost so to save his reputation he suffered me to go unpunished my term of actual service to mr edward covey ended on christmas day eighteen thirty three the days between christmas and new year's day are allowed as holidays and accordingly we were not required to perform any labor more than to feed and take care of the stock this time we regarded as our own by the grace of our masters and we therefore used or abused it nearly as we pleased those of us who had families at a distance were generally allowed to spend the whole six days in their society this time however was spent in various ways the staid sober thinking and industrious ones of our number would employ themselves in making corn brooms mats horse collars and baskets and another class of us would spend the time in hunting opossums hares and coons but by far the larger part engaged in such sports and merriments as playing ball wrestling running foot races fiddling dancing and drinking whiskey and this latter mode of spending the time was by far the most agreeable to the feelings of our masters a slave who would work during the holidays was considered by our masters as scarcely deserving them he was regarded as one who rejected the favor of his master it was deemed a disgrace not to get drunk at christmas 
and he was regarded as lazy indeed who had not provided himself with the necessary means during the year to get whiskey enough to last him through christmas from what i know of the effect of these holidays upon the slave i believe them to be among the most effective means in the hands of the slaveholder in keeping down the spirit of insurrection were the slaveholders at once to abandon this practice i have not the slightest doubt it would lead to an immediate insurrection among the slaves these holidays serve as conductors or safety valves to carry off the rebellious spirit of enslaved humanity but for these the slave would be forced up to the wildest desperation and woe betide the slaveholder the day he ventures to remove or hinder the operation of those conductors i warn him that in such an event a spirit will go forth in their midst more to be dreaded than the most appalling earthquake the holidays are part and parcel of the gross fraud wrong and inhumanity of slavery they are professedly a custom established by the benevolence of the slaveholders but i undertake to say it is the result of selfishness and one of the grossest frauds committed upon the downtrodden slave they do not give the slaves this time because they would not like to have their work during its continuance but because they know it would be unsafe to deprive them of it this will be seen by the fact that the slaveholders like to have their slaves spend those days just in such a manner as to make them as glad of their ending as of their beginning their object seems to be to disgust their slaves with freedom by plunging them into the lowest depths of dissipation for instance the slaveholders not only like to see the slave drink of his own accord but will adopt various plans to make him drunk one plan is to make bets on their slaves as to who can drink the most whiskey without getting drunk and in this way they succeed in getting whole multitudes to drink to excess thus when the slave asks for virtuous freedom the cunning slaveholder knowing his ignorance cheats him with a dose of vicious dissipation artfully labelled with the name of liberty the most of us used to drink it down and the result was just what might be supposed many of us were led to think that there was little to choose between liberty and slavery we felt and very properly too that we had almost as well be slaves to man as to rum so when the holidays ended we staggered up from the filth of our wallowing took a long breath and marched to the field feeling upon the whole rather glad to go from what our master had deceived us into a belief was freedom back to the arms of slavery i have said that this mode of treatment is a part of the whole system of fraud and inhumanity of slavery it is so the mode here adopted to discuss the slave with freedom by allowing him to see only the abuse of it is carried out in other things for instance a slave loves molasses he steals some his master in many cases goes off to town and buys a large quantity he returns takes his whip and commands the slave to eat the molasses until the poor fellow is made sick at the very mention of it the same mode is sometimes adopted to make the slaves refrain from asking for more food than their regular allowance a slave runs through his allowance and applies for more his master is enraged at him but not willing to send him off without food gives him more than is necessary and compels him to eat it within a given time then if he complains that he cannot eat it he is said to be satisfied neither full nor fasting and is whipped for being hard to please i have an abundance of such illustrations of the same principle drawn from my own observation but i think the cases i have cited sufficient the practice is a very common one end of chapter ten part one